was a night unlike any other. There was a stillness in the air, a quiet calm in the evening sky. Grace was on the horizon, an unfathomable mercy, a love deeper than anyone had ever known. This silent night was about to give way to a chorus which would change the world forever. For on this day, in the city of David, is born a Savior, Jesus, the Son of God, the Word in flesh. God had reached down from heaven to earth to draw us to himself, to make a way, to bring us home. Today, the heart of God is on full display. For God so loved the world. Merry Christmas. Hey, it's good to be with you. Thanks for all of you who joined us here in the room. And uh, for everybody who's online watching as well, and even to the balcony, welcome. <laughs> you know, this, is, um, this really is, for me, the start of the season. Uh, shopping for Christmas gifts, yes, that's sometimes fun, sometimes not. Um, eating Christmas food, I mean, we've already started our celebration, but for me, it's this moment right here, where we get to sing, and we get to watch awesome kid videos, <laughs> and we get to worship. Um, you might think, like, as a pastor, uh, that Christmas Eve service is a service that's really easy to preach, um, but I'm going to tell you it's not. It's actually one of the most difficult services of the year to preach because of this. You're telling the same story every year to a lot of the same people who already know the story, right? I mean, there's, there's a baby who's born to a virgin, right? And these angels show up to shepherds. And then these wise men show up, and there's a guy who's not real happy about that. His name is King Herod. I mean, you know the story, right? So I was thinking about this. How do we take this story and make it fresh and new? Because the last thing I want to do is take a magnificent, miraculous, powerful story and make it common, right? And so this year, as I started reading uh, through the Christmas story again and again, I began to notice something that was right there in front of me all along, but I've actually never addressed it in a message. And the interesting thing is actually, it's in your Christmas celebration every single year, and you may have not noticed this issue at all, but as soon as I mention it, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's true. The issue I'm talking about is this. Have you ever noticed how some people have control issues at Christmas time? Now, this is not the time to start pointing to people or looking down the road, but let me just let me just give you a couple of examples, okay? It's very possible that someone in your family has control issues when it comes to Christmas lights and decorations. Now, there's some of you that you do all the work and it's just because no one else will help you. But there might be someone in your family that's like, mm, no, 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 put that down because you don't know how to do it right. Because apparently there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it and there's one person in your family who knows how to do it right. There might be someone in your family who has control issues around Christmas music. If you want to find out, walk in the house and say, hey, Alexa, change the music to, and there's going to be someone in there that looks at you like, what are you doing? Don't mess with Christmas music. By the way, do you know what the highest selling Christmas album is of all time? No, not Mariah Carey. That's Pastor Josh's girl's favorite song. <laughs> Poor guy, he's outnumbered in his house. Elvis Presley, yes. Someone in your family might actually have uh, control issues around Christmas food. And this is actually one of my favorites. Someone in your family might not let anyone else bring food to the Christmas dinner because they don't know how to do it just right. But this is the precious part of it. Somewhere in all of the preparation, they go, they, they start complaining like, oh my gosh, this is so much work for me. And then you say, well, hey, I can make a dessert if you want. And they look at you like, don't be ridiculous. Those are control issues. Uh, Christmas gifts. 
Some people may have control issues around Christmas gifts. Oh, you can't get that. That's, that's not nice enough because all the gifts you give have to be like reciprocal, right? Or maybe that's not nice enough or maybe that's too nice or it's just right. Or how about when you open gifts? Are there any Christmas Eve night people? That's when you open your gifts? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. Anybody? Wow. And the rest of you are all Christmas morning? Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, before or after breakfast? You see, you see what I'm saying? Like someone in your family has decided that they're in charge of that and it's, it's, there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. Now, I'm kind of joking with you, but let me put you to ease. You're not the first people to face Christmas with control issues. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was born on the earth, the people who were involved in his story had all kinds of control issues. Let me show it to you. First of all, it's Joseph, all right? This is how Matthew opens the Christmas story. I'm reading from Matthew chapter one. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. What's Joseph trying to control? He's trying to control his story, his reputation, her reputation. He's trying to control his, his story. He's put in this dilemma, right? He's engaged to this bride. She comes up pregnant. Joseph knows they haven't been together like that. And she's like, Joseph, there's no other guy. And Mary's like, actually, Joseph, this is a gift from God. Do you see his dilemma? Joseph, at this moment, He's trying to control the story. Why? He's a good guy. He's like you and me. He's responsible. And so being the responsible person he is, he's going to do something about it. He's going to control the story. So here's his plan. Ready? Uh, he's going to break up with Mary. He's going to keep it on the down low. He doesn't want to shame her because he loves her, but he has a plan because he's going to control his story. The problem is this though. God he has a different plan. So God sends this angel to Joseph, right, to communicate God's plan. This is how it goes. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's God's plan. And at this point in the story, Joseph stops trying to control it and instead of controlling the story, he simply joins the story. There's a whole group of people there that actually are a really good example of just joining the story. Yeah, you know, the shepherds that are out in the countryside, they're watching the sheep. These angels show up. They announce that this baby has been born to them. And in a magnificent style, right? You know how this goes. One angel shows up and then there's a whole host and they're singing this song and there's these bright lights. And, and wow, I mean, you'd be stunned. You know what their response was? They're like, let's go. That's literally what they said. Luke chapter two, verse 15. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. They don't try to control the story. No one says, it's already night. We really shouldn't go knock on someone's door this late. Nobody says, who's gonna watch the sheep? Nobody says, I'm kind of tired. Let's go tomorrow. See, instead of control the story, they actually, they just join the story. And this is God's invitation, I think, to you and me, to join the story that God has laid out in the birth of Jesus. But before we talk more about that, can we talk about the most egregious person in the story? His name is King Herod, uh, the self-professed Herod the Great. He is a power-hungry, paranoid control freak. Let me just tell you a couple stories about King Herod, okay? Okay. Um, he had a bunch of sons, three of them Herod thought were eyeing his throne. So he had them put to death because he was in control of his kingdom. He was such a bully, such a terrible person that when he got ill and he knew he was going to die, he was afraid that nobody would mourn his death. So he's in the city of Jericho. And he invites these prominent figures from all over the area, these men to come and, and join him in Jericho. When they arrive, you know what he does? He has them killed right before he dies. You know why? He just wanted a bunch of people mourning when he died too. And this guy's a, 
He's a piece of work. Herod, this is where he shows up in the, in the Christmas story. These wise men come knocking on his door. And on his doorstep, the wise men ask him this question. I mean, think about this for a moment. Here's Herod. You have these wise men show up, and they ask him, hey, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. Like, oh, guys, this is such the wrong question. The control freak who kills people who think who he thinks they want to become a king in his area, oh, he doesn't want to... He doesn't want to go worship Jesus. He wants to kill him. So here's what Herod does. He says, oh, would you go and search carefully for the child as soon as you find him? Report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And you know how this story goes. The, these wise men, they never go back to Herod, but they find out when that star appeared in the sky and he found out that it was about two years that they had traveled there. And so Herod had every two-year-old and under killed in the town of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Now, um, I really want to be super, super clear about this because I just gave you an example of a super horrible person. I am not saying that any of us are Herod. But don't we approach the Christmas story trying to control our own kingdom? So if I become a Christian, what does God want from me? I mean, what would that require of me if I was going to become a Christian, actually give God control of my life? What if I actually joined his story? I'll get back to this in just a minute. I think it's interesting that the wise men are actually in total comparison uh, to King Herod. Uh, the wise men, they're not trying to control their kingdom. They actually left their kingdom behind, traveled for two years, as the story goes, arrive at this place and they give gold, frankincense, and myrrh, treasure, to say, oh, that's not ours. I just came to bring this to you, to worship you. These wise men, they're not in trying to control their kingdom. They're trying to give from their kingdom to worship this Jesus. Because of this, they believed that somehow God was involved in this, that this wasn't just a baby. They saw their kingdom and their wealth as small in comparison to what God was doing on that Christmas day in the birth of his son. I think they actually felt honored to be a part of the story, not like they had to control the story. So here's the point. Jesus obviously doesn't come to be this cute little baby, right? From the very beginning, God made it really clear. In Matthew chapter 1, it says, She will give birth to a son. You're to give him the name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. That's God's story. And that's the story that he invites you and me to join. So how do you join the story? Let me give you three quick things. It's by receiving the gift of forgiveness. It's by receiving the gift of relationship with God. And then... What you received, you pass on to other people. You share the story with them. But here's our problem. Our problem is this, is that we often, if we're real honest, I have control issues. And I say things like, God, it, I know, you know my life belongs to you, but there's certain things in my life that are my life. And I don't want to be told what to do about it. Um, what if God, if you really did embrace him and join his story, what if he actually wanted to mess with your plans? What if his plans were different than your plans? Who gets their way? And in that moment, if you're not sure, maybe we actually do have some control issues in us that this Christmas God might want to put to rest. What if God wants me to live differently right now? What if I became a Christian, and what would I tell my family and friends who've always known me as maybe a spiritual person, but not really limited to Jesus, right? Or maybe they just know I've been an atheist or agnostic all my life. What if I actually joined God's story? I feel like a lot of us, we feel like we have to control the story because of this. I think in the last couple years, it's been hard. Am I right? 
I mean, we live in a world that's become much more fearful and fragile, where you and I feel more vulnerable probably than we ever have. And when fear is there, the natural reaction is, I have to protect and I have to control. You know what's funny about that? None of us have control. (laughs) You don't have control over your drive home tonight. You might be a great driver, but you don't really have control. There's a false assumption that we can protect ourselves, provide for ourselves, that we have everything under control. And the reality is this, we don't. So we can go through life with a false sense of security, or we can go through life with a God who has written a story for us, and he invites us to participate in his story as well. I think this is part of it, though. Have you ever had these thoughts before? Let me just give you a list of these. You ready? Um, Jesus, I believe in you, but uh, my kingdom is my kingdom. I don't want you to tell me what to do in my kingdom. Uh, Jesus, listen, you can lead my life, but my dating life is actually my dating life, so stay out of it. Maybe, maybe you've never said it that way, but you've acted like that. How about Jesus? You're king, but my job is my job. Listen, I have control there. Jesus, you're the king, but my friends are my friends, and I don't want you to tell me what to do there. Jesus, my Saturday nights are my Saturday nights. Hey, I, I prayed a prayer once, but listen, those are my nights. I give you Sundays. I, I, I get Saturdays, right? I don't think we're as diabolical as Herod is, but do you ever wrestle with Jesus for control of your kingdom? I think there's one great character. There's a lot of great people in this story, but there's one who models this total surrender to God's plan. This is her story. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary and says this, do not be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you're to call him Jesus. And Mary's super confused about all this. So she asks the angel these these questions And the angel responds to her, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now Mary, she still had plenty of questions. She could have tried to control her story or write her own story, but she doesn't. Listen to the words found in the Bible of her response. I, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. What'd she say? God, I'm all in. Let's go. God, you're bigger than I am. You're more powerful than I am. You know better than I am. It's your story, not my story. I would just be honored that my story could be a part of your story. And she says, let's go. What if we did the same? I think God invites us to his story by this, to receive him as our savior. To receive him as our savior, so, and that's the gift of forgiveness. But he also invites us to receive him as our Lord, which is the gift of relationship, where he's in charge, and we follow him. His invitation is this, it's to save us and lead us, but the issue is that we often have control issues. So here's, I think, the key to giving control to God, and it's this one word. It's trust. Do you trust God? I mean, how do you you trust God? And what is the thing that would make you trust him? I think it's two things. You ready? Here it is. Number one, do you actually believe he loves you? Do you believe he loves you? And the second is this. Do you think he's powerful enough to help you? Because if you can answer those two questions, you can decide whether you trust God or not. And John 3, 16, one of those famous verses in all the scripture, answers this question. For God so, you know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And then when Jesus shows up time and time again, what does he do? These powerful miracles. And then the greatest miracle of all, he's dead for days and then he's raised back to life. He loves you, and he is powerful enough to handle anything going on in your world. Personally, for me and my family, I think these last couple years have been interesting. We've been watching our kids grow up, get married, 
graduate from college, one of them just last week. And at the same time, Kelly and I are this sandwich generation. We're, we're taking care of our, our kids and watching them move into adulthood, and now we're sandwiched between the taking care of our parents kind of thing. There's been some things going on in our world there with Kel's dad that's been really hard to go, God, we have no control over this. It's just his reminder that he can be trusted because we know he loves us. and We know he's powerful enough to help us. See, the Christian life isn't promised to be the easy life. It's the promise to be the God with you life. So let me just wrap this up with this. Um, can you trust him to receive his leadership, his rescue plan, his leadership in your life? Um, or will you allow fear to make you try to write your own story and lead your own life? So tonight, here's what I'd love to do. Um, I just want to, I want to end it just by praying. But I want you to pray instead of me pray. Um, and I wonder if there's a prayer that might resonate with you. I'm going to show you a couple up on the, the screen behind me. The first is this, I trust in Jesus' death to save me. And for some of you, maybe that's the prayer that you have. Yeah, I believe that there's a God who loves me. I really do believe in the Christmas story that this baby was born, but he wasn't born just to come and be cute. He was born to die on a cross to pay for our sins. And so I wonder if, um, if that's your prayer tonight. I trust in Jesus' death to save me. Now, it's interesting because the next prayer is, I, I trust in Jesus' death to lead, or Jesus to lead my life. It's interesting because becoming a Christian is not just, oh, God, rescue me. It actually is, God, I'm here to follow you. It's both those prayers. But maybe you pray to, hey, God, rescue me before, but you know that there's a control thing in your life. You're like, I just don't want to give this part of my life to God. And maybe you're ready to pray that tonight. I trust Jesus to lead my life. Maybe it's this. I trust in Jesus' love and power to care for me. If you have a crisis, an anxiety, a stress, a situation in your life this Christmas, that you just need to feel the love of God in you. You need to know that his power holds you in the midst of those circumstances. Maybe that's prayer. That prayer is for you. Can we pray right now? I would invite you to bow your heads or maybe just keep staring at those prayers. And maybe one of those is what you need to pray tonight. So take a moment. And I want you to have a conversation with God. And listen, I, I know that some of y'all are here and you're like, I've never had a conversation with God. Just talk to him. You can talk to him in your head, your heart. You can even whisper so that your ears can hear what you're saying to God. And for some of you, that first and second prayer right there, that really is a coming to Jesus turning point, becoming a Christian kind of prayer. And maybe that's your decision tonight. If it is, that's awesome. It's life-changing. Where your story gets to join his story. Let's bow our heads just for a moment. God, I thank you for these folks who are here tonight, whether they're listening online or in this very room, that God, we would know that the gift of your son is because you, you love us. You loved us 2,000 years ago when he first came and you still love us today. And we give thanks for that. And so Jesus, let us not walk in fear today, but let us walk with an understanding that you are with us, you are for us, you love us, and your power is available to us. And so God, we rest in you this Christmas. And I pray it's not just today, God, but the rest of this week, the rest of this month, for the rest of our lives, God, that we would walk with you. And everybody said, amen.